end of the world. Stay faithful. Stay brave. And no matter what, obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Deciphering Daniel with Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. I'm uh, thankful that we're in the study of the book of Daniel. Um, this is going to be a hard mes message for me today. And the reason is because this week we've had to deal with some very serious problems in my family. It's not me, it's not my wife, it's not my children. But I come with probably having shed more tears in the last couple days than any other time in my life. I don't really want to share more than that for the sake of restoration of the individuals involved, but the deacons are a part of the situation, and I believe that God is going to work in incredible ways through this, what seems like such a tragedy. I will speak more about it this evening to the members after the service, and what I want from you today is your prayers, because <laughs> I probably shouldn't be preaching today, but I, I felt like it's, it's God's plan, and I, I believe the topic fits so well with what we're going to deal with today. So I'm sorry to kind of put that on you, but I think unless I did, you would be wondering what's wrong with the pastor. You probably wonder that most Sundays. <laughs> but I know everything's gonna be okay. I know God is in control, and I know when something shatters into a million pieces and we have no way to fix it, that's when God does what he does. And it's, it's gonna be a miracle, but I know there's always hope, right? There's always hope. And so, again, I'm, I'm sorry to be vague, but uh, for the sake of those involved, I need to be somewhat vague. Our church family, though, needs to know, and I will share that with you this evening. I would like, though, to discuss this important and awesome topic, and that is the span of a faithful man. We've been reading about this incredible man named Daniel, a man who was a prophet extraordinaire, a man who Jesus mentioned, Daniel the prophet, and one that we don't find any egregious faults or sins in his life. Now, was Daniel a sinner? Yes, why? Because all have sinned. And Daniel would be the first one to tell you he was a sinner. But of the very few in scripture, Daniel was one that we don't see any major horrible failures. As a matter of fact, we see quite the opposite of that, and that gives me hope. Even if you have experienced a, an egregious failure or any type of failure in your life or sin, this should still give you hope because from today on, you can be faithful, okay? There's, I don't care what's happened in the past, from this point on, you can do it because you have the ability through the Spirit of God to be a changed person and to overcome any uh, past or any issues or anything that you may have done. God never quits on you. And God didn't quit on Daniel, but Daniel never gave God any reason to either. Daniel was a faithful man for his entire life span. He, we believe, went into captivity in his mid-teens. We would say maybe 17. Let's just pick an age. And we were certain it would be no, no later than 17. From 17 all the way to 90 years old, his life spanned the entire 70-year captivity. Now, that's very important because we think he died, he died in exile. He didn't come back with, with others, but... His, his life spanned that entire time, and he was a 
a spokesman of the promise of God, a proof of the promise of God, that God wasn't done with Israel. We fail the Lord, he doesn't fail us. I wanna zero in for a minute on that word span, and if you look at that in the dictionary, you're gonna find a definition for the noun span, which is uh, something I want you to do, is hold up a, a hand. If you're in the right mind, you'll hold up your right hand. Some of you left-handers. I couldn't say that when Dad was alive. Uh, and stretch out your thumb and your, your pointer finger, that is a span. The distance between your thumb and your finger, that's a span. The dictionary says the span also is a limited space of time as the term or period of living or our span on the earth. That's not a very big distance, is it? Right? This is a small distance. What does that tell me? That tells me that our life is a vapor. We were recently in Fairbanks, Alaska. No one goes there in the winter, but we did. And every time you breathe in Alaska in the winter, your, your breath is hanging in the air for a few minutes. It's almost like an iceberg sitting there. The, 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 the breath comes out warm and moist. It instantly vaporizes, and then it's gone. That's the life that God has blessed us with. You say, well, uh, Daniel lived to be 90. And again, that's fairly rare in that time frame without all of the modern miracles of medicine that we have today. He lived a long life. But we find others in scripture. I believe Stephen was a young man. Stephen died a martyr. But he still lived the span that God gave him. David Brainerd the incredible missionary to the Native Americans here in America lived to be 29. But that was the span that God gave him. I want you younger people to know one thing. We don't know how long we have. Let us serve the Lord with everything we have today. And let us say from today on, we are gonna serve the Lord. And hopefully the young people in this room can say, I am not going to make those mistakes that I find in scripture. I'm not gonna have those moments. I'm gonna be like a Daniel. I'm gonna be like a Joseph. We have those examples in the Bible of people that we don't have to fail, we don't have to fall. Some people say, yeah, God has to break you. If you're prideful, he does. Let's not be prideful. Daniel had that testimony. So what I want to do today is read through the text verses that we're covering today in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Daniel. Our series is called Deciphering Daniel. And we're going to read through Daniel 1, 17 through 21 today. And then we're going to go back through it uh, bit by bit and, and pull it out and um, understand it the way God intends us to. In Daniel 1, 7... In Daniel 1.17, the Bible says, as for these four children, now that word children can mean teenager, and it does, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. What I want you to focus on in a minute is this right here, God gave. We'll talk about that in a second. Verse 18, now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, remember there was a, a, a time frame in which the, the king was going to give them the secular education uh, to make them able to be advisors and uh, people that could work in his household and in his courts. Uh, the, the best of the best he had taken captive out of Israel and they were the ones of the seed of the king so these would have been potential uh, royalty. So he took them captive from their homeland in Israel out to uh, Babylon, which would have been in uh, Iraq, modern Iraq. And uh, they were there getting the uh, indoctrination of the Babylonians. At the end of those three years, the king had said that he should bring them in. The prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, which is interesting to me that this is the king Nebuchadnezzar himself, remember he is the king of the great Babylonian empire. We still marvel when we look at the uh, arch architecture and the splendor of that civilization, the first world empire. 
He was the king of that. And the king, verse 19, communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times, I love that, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And these were the the wise, uh, educated uh, people of his realm. Of course, they were also in the occult and and astrology and things like that, which aren't, aren't right. But he was, these, these four were 10 times better. Verse 21, and, the key, and Daniel, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So that's how we know how long he lived. He lived, his span of his life covered not only many different kings, but it also covered many different empires, or two different empires, which is incredible. So today I want you to, to learn four things. The first is this. And I, don't want, I want you to learn it more than just, oh, yeah, I hear you. No, I want you to learn this. I want this to be what you hear today. I want you to take home, and I want you to live this. Because we're not playing church here. Okay? We're just not playing church. We're going to be real before God. And if we're not real before God, then why are you doing this? Right? God is a giver. And this is such an incredible thing. Re- remember the devil is a created being. I'm going to talk about the devil in a minute. A pretty deep theological conversation that my five-year-old granddaughter and I had yesterday. Um, That'll put the fear of God in you when your granddaughter starts asking you deep theological questions. But God is a giver. The devil is a liar. He's going to make you think that you want something, that you have to have something, that you deserve something. But if you do it, if you take it, you're going to be hurt and you're going to hurt people. And it's, how, how stupid can we be when God so clearly warns us he doesn't want to withhold anything from you. God gave them. Look at these three words. God gave them. These four children, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, gave them. The reward was wisdom. The reward was understanding. Daniel's reward, remember Daniel's reward was to be the prime minister of two great world empires. Isn't that neat? And who knows what else Daniel's reward is now. You know, that's his earthly reward. God rewards faithfulness. Why? Is it so you can get some gifts? Hey, believe me, I like gifts. Gifts are great. But the gift isn't really what's so awesome, is it? It's the giver. It's the, it's the person that thought of you. It's the person that wants to show you something. It's not the gift. And it's the same way with God. Why does God reward faithfulness? So the world can see his generosity and his love. That's why. It's not about the gift. It's not about Daniel being a prime minister or Daniel having certain amount of wisdom or understanding or interpretation of dreams. That's all cool. I'm not going to say no to whatever God wants to do. I'm thrilled with that, but it's not about the gift. It's about God declaring himself to the world. There is one true God, and he's good, and he wants to give. He doesn't want to hold back. Don't believe that lie. Now, somebody has said this. If you want to make a living, you get vocational training, trade school, apprenticeship, whatever. Work with your, if your dad is a a mechanic, you're going to work out in the garage with your dad. That's a great way to make a living. If you want to make a life, they say get education, which, again, nothing wrong with education, nothing wrong with vocational training. But let me tell you something. If you want to serve God, you must have something that only God can give you, and that's wisdom. Training and education will never be substitutes 
for the ability and wisdom that God and only God can give you. So three, think about that. Remember that. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. Because I think I know how many hands would go up if I asked you this question. Keep your hands down. But do any of you lack wisdom? <laughs> you want to raise your hand, right? I do. Okay, I'm going to raise my hand. How many of you lack wisdom? Raise your hand. Okay, we got that over with. Now, if you lack wisdom, you're fortunate because James 1.5 says you do, well, it implies that you do. If any of you lack wisdom, what does it say? Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. You say, well, we're not supposed to be liberals. <laughs> well, God is liberal in this area. He wants to bless you, wants to give, he wants to grace you with blessings. He upbraideth not, he doesn't withhold, he, he gives, he gives, he gives, and it shall be given. So if you lack wisdom, ask God. That's a, that should be a prayer every day. I think that was a prayer that Daniel had all the time. Lord, give me wisdom. Because there's a lot of things in this life you don't know what to do. I actually had no idea how to handle something this week. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. So you, you're, you're minute by minute saying, Lord, help me right now. I, I don't know what to do. I don't have a plan. We, we don't have a, a protocol for this. We know what to do is the right thing, but how do you maneuver through all of this? God wants to give you gifts, and he wants to reward you, and he wants to give you wisdom. And you just have to ask. The second thing I want you to notice today and, and bring this home is that God wants to give you wisdom. Wisdom. So look at Daniel 1.17. The second part of that verse, it says God gave them knowledge. That word knowledge is thinking skills, logic. So it's almost like uh, we all understand computers somewhat, right? Um, there was one of the flights, and they have all those videos now that you can stream on flights, and it kind of helps some of the time to pass. And there's probably only like 10 out of 1,000 that are okay to watch. So there, I'm trying to find ones that are okay. One is uh, like understanding computers for stupid people. So like, oh, let's watch that one. It's more for Karen. But no, no, she, that was horrible. On Valentine's, who would, who would say such things? No, it was, it was me. I, 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 you know, I kind of know what they do, but like, you know, give me the nuts and bolts of it. And basically you have input, you have output, you have computing or processing. It's really not that complicated, right? Uh, but, but we all have incredible computers that God has given us. And I think what God did for Daniel and his three buddies, because of their faithfulness, he just like cranked it up a little bit. Okay, that's knowledge. The ability to retain knowledge and then also skill in all learning and wisdom. Um, I believe that when we're talking about um, understanding and wisdom, it's the ability to discern uh, the right way to interpret information and knowledge. So God blessed them in these ways. And then Daniel, it says, uh, this is, you know, the, the four of them got, got these items from God, but the, Daniel had this. He had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I think, you know, the world wants uh, to to know what's coming up, right? Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you be a rich person if you knew exactly what the stock market was gonna do? I know some of you manage money, and it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of skill in that, I understand that, and I really respect all of you that do that, but there's also a whole lot of uh, crossing your fingers, you know, and I guess that's something Christians shouldn't have, right, luck? Uh, crossing fingers, you ever say knock on wood, and just the dumbest superstitious things we say, but we say it, um, but, but you, you, we don't know. You don't know. If, if these people that had these, uh, you know, uh, um, palm reading little houses, why are they always a dump? I mean, if they could read the future, wouldn't they have these incredible mansions? I mean, t don't be stupid, okay? Um, don't read your, what do they call that? The, yeah, don't, don't, don't get into all that. That's not God's wisdom, that's, that's the world's foolishness and it's actually demonic, it's occultic, it's satanic.
but, but God gave the, Daniel this supernatural ability to understand dreams, to understand visions. And in the first half of his life, these were things that others had that Daniel were, was able to interpret. And then in the second half of his life, Daniel was having his own visions and dreams, and God was again helping him understand that. And because of that, we're able to read the future in the book right here. So, so we have something that is truly astounding. People criticize Daniel because there's no way it could have been written when it was said to have been written. There's no way it could have been because it's astoundingly accurate. And there are still prophecies in the book of Daniel that are yet future. Okay, So a Bible-believing Christian, you have a real edge on the future. Only we can know the future because we have what God has said about the future. You say, well, how can God know the future? Um, the only way I can understand it is God is outside of time, and also God knows every probability. And he moves, he works, not ever changing our free will, but still uh, manipulating even the wicked to accomplish his purpose. So he knows that his purpose will be accomplished. He knows exactly how it will be accomplished. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to understand, but only scripture gives us true, accurate, fulfilled prophecy. The Mayans made guesses, and a couple of them were right, hundreds of them were wrong, but we flock to the Mayans or we flock to Nostradamus, same exact thing. We should flock to the Bible. The Bible has it, so don't be stupid. God wants to give you wisdom. Now, some of you have received these secular educations, uh, and again, I think they're, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a secular education, as long as you, God has given you the wisdom and understanding to filter out the things that are not true, the things that God uh, has not told us. So, so you have to be really, really careful. The Apostle Paul, if you'll remember, he was trained in um, the, the the school of, it was the Jewish religion of the day, but also he would have been very well versed in uh, the Greek education philosophy. He would have known all the classics. As a matter of fact, when you read Paul's Gospels, God moved him along, God told him what to write, but you still see his understanding, you still see the way that he approached things, and he would use his secular education to help win those that were in that world. So be careful about that type of an education. Um, I think it's really stupid for us to throw young people into that. Um, we've been telling them their whole life that God made us, and I'm hoping we're, we have really grounded them, but then uh, at 18 they go off and everything they hear in the secular realm, every professor um, either disbelieves this book Says, says that we got here by chance. Uh, they'll actually come against the, the Bible most of the time. Most of the college university professors are anti-scripture. They are. So then we throw our children into that and it, it ruins them, okay? But can we use, I mean, Daniel survived a secular education, which is astounding to me, he did. I'm not saying that we should do that, but he did. So we can use that to reach people. So. Let's say the Apostle Paul was taught the classics. And one author said this. He said, beware of the atmosphere of the classics. True, we ought to know them, but only as chemists handle poison. To discover their qualities, not to infect their blood with them. So just beware of that uh, world's wisdom and let's focus on God's wisdom in our own lives. But Daniel would be able to understand the mindset, the philosophy of the Babylonian because he had all of this schooling and then he was able to use that as he was trying to show the astrologers, the magicians, the, the Chaldeans, the sorcerers that there is one true God and he is far above any Babylonian philosophy. God grace Daniel. People are curious though about the future. Um, and God warns us about this. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and as they were going to be uh, entering into this promised land, this land was filled with Canaanites. The, the Canaanite 
term is a term that covers all the people groups that were living in that part of the world, which we would today call Israel. It was the land of Canaan. They had different people groups, but they were called the Canaanites in general. But the Canaanites were very wicked. And you wonder, why, why would God say for them to destroy everybody as they entered the land? Well, here's why. Deuteronomy 18.10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. What does that mean? That means the Canaanites were worshiping Moloch, and they were literally sacrificing their children to the gods. Uh, just d- despicable, awful behavior. Uh, and then God continues to warn Israel, or useth divination, or observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, uh, it, or charmer, consulter with familiar spirits, or wizard, or necromancer. Necromancer's someone that speaks to the dead. So there's a lot of this that actually goes on in our world today. Uh, and God has warned us clearly uh, about these things and to avoid these types of uh, ways of trying to obtain the future. We have the Bible, right? We don't need any other way, and all the rest of the stuff is, I, in my opinion, very demonic and very uh, uh, will easily pull you down. Verse 12, And all that do those things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God both doth drive them out from before thee. Now, some people say, well, God spoke to me in a dream. And they'll say that today. God spoke to me in a dream. If someone tells me that, um, I first say it probably was too many onions on your meal last night. Um, or I will say, well, you know, especially God said this, and this is what we should do. I, and I always will say, well, God didn't speak to me, and therefore I think we should just do what he said here, right? So be really careful about people that say that. Um, God does speak today, but he speaks through this. So there's some really important warnings, especially if you're a new believer, to not fall for all of this stuff. Uh, You know, some people just say, well, God will just teach me everything through dreams. Wouldn't that be nice? You put a Bible under your pillow, you put your head on the pillow, and just everything comes up through through the pillow into your head. Now that would sell if you had a pillow like that. We'll call it God's pillow. And uh, just the, the knowledge comes up and you have all this incredible knowledge and wisdom and understanding. No, what does it take? It takes diligence. It takes study, it takes time. If you neglect this book, you will not know what God wants for you in your life. You'll be fooled, you'll be tricked. Those that don't neglect this book, if you make it a serious priority in your life, you will hear from God every day. And then I believe with the spirit of God's help that indwells the believer, you will not be deceived by that devil. God wants us to be diligent, not lazy, studying the word of God. Number three, God's way, say this with me, always works. God's way always works. Uh, Look at Daniel 1.18. Now at the end of the days, the king had said that he should bring them in when the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king communed communed with them and among them, all, so how many were there of these Hebrew slaves that were of the, the seed of the king of Judah? Um, I don't know. I would, I'm guessing dozens. There would be dozens of them in that, in that group. Uh, of course, the four that we know about are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as they were called, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Bendigo, Belteshazzar. Uh, they're Babylonian names. But none of all of these were found like these four. Therefore they stood before the king in all manners of wisdom and understanding. The king inquired of them. He found them, I love this, ten times better. Ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. They found none like those four. Isn't that wonderful? So God is real. God is good. God, God's way always works. And you may say, well, it doesn't seem like it. It does. Just be patient. Just wait. Give it time. Continue day by day, here a little, there a little. That's something that dad always said. Uh, the Christian life isn't just this one big victory and then everything is, no, it's, it's a, a little here, a little there, learning, growing. Uh, it's, it's that little seed that it just takes so long, but one day it's gonna be a mighty tree, right? And that's how our life needs to be, but it works. It will always, always work. Let's look at the promise that God gave to Israel, and I believe also to us, this would be a promise that I think Daniel would have been taught as a young man. 
uh, as his parents opened up the scripture to him and said, uh, Daniel, let's turn in our scrolls to 1 Samuel 2 in verse 30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. This is what God has said. Honor God, how do you honor God? You know what he says, and you, by the spirit of God's power and help in your life, you do it. You are faithful to your spouse until death do you part. That's doing it God's way. Um, And if you failed in that, God can restore you. God can can put the pieces back together. And I know that's a fact, because I've seen it. And it's beautiful when God has restored and, and, and done that. But if you honor God, he will honor you. Okay, just keep that in mind. That's what Daniel experienced in his life. In spite of the circumstances, remember, he was ripped from his family, he was taken from his homeland, he was thrown into a godless, wicked culture, and Daniel, young Daniel, was still determined to honor God. He believed this verse, he lived this verse, and then God honored Daniel's obedience and promoted him time and time again. What a great success story in Scripture of the span of a faithful man. Let us be reminded, as Israel was reminded, of blessings and righteousness. Um, Following God is the only way, the only way, and God's way always works. And then the fourth thing is this. I love this. God never quits. God never quits, ever, ever, ever. And that means nor should we, right? Okay, let's read the... The final verse, Daniel 121. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Ah, man. And that's the end of chapter one. It's pretty, pretty amazing that we've covered one full chapter already. Daniel's not a long book, but there's a lot more to talk about. Let's talk about this with our chart. So look at your chart today. If you don't have one, uh, you can get one by going to our website at ingrace.us, uh, but we have here the prophecy chart from the book of Daniel, and the one thing I want you to notice when it says that Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus, remember, he's gonna have a dream, and we'll talk about that soon, the statue, where you have a head of gold, chest of silver, the uh, midsection of bronze, and then the legs of iron, and then uh, uh, iron and clay, the feet, And so this statue, the Bible tells us, is the rise and fall of world empires. So Daniel was taken captive right here in this first timeline, uh, and uh, it it began the captivity of the Jewish people. Jerusalem also was destroyed around that same time by Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have this 70-year span where God was giving, uh, taking what the children of Israel weren't giving, uh, that was the, the land Sabbath. Then we have, the, and that's another uh, dream and vision that Daniel interpreted, and uh, this represents both the head and the lion with wings represents the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, and subsequent kings, all the way to the fall, and we'll read about that, the fall of Babylon with Belshazzar, and uh, the writing on the wall, remember that story? The writing on the, the hand of God wrote on the wall, basically, tonight is your last night, as he was drunk, drinking from the vessels from the temple of God in Israel. And then we have a new king. We have the kings of the Medes and Persians, and Daniel continued into this kingdom, into this second world empire, and that's the life that he lived. He was able to, uh, to bring the gospel. Can you imagine this? Daniel was able to bring the gospel to uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, and uh, uh, the Persian and Mede uh, kings, the Darius and Cyrus, probably heard the gospel from Daniel. And think of all the other high court officials that, that he was able to give the gospel to. So what I'm trying to say is, when you do things God's way, you're gonna have incredible opportunities. You just won't believe the things that God does and he can orchestrate it in such an amazing way. But it spanned this entire captivity. Why is this important? because the promise of God was to 
Israel forever. Remember that? The promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was I will bless you um, if you obey me, but there was an unconditional blessing that I will bless the whole world through you. There was no condition to that. So they failed time and time again, and God had to continue to chasten them to bring them back. But there is a day, look here, at the, the end of uh, the time as we know it, this is what we call the millennial kingdom of Christ, and then Israel is restored. God is not done with Israel. There's still a future plan for Israel, and I believe Daniel's life spanning that whole 70 year captivity proves that out. We have a consistent testimony of a Jewish man that whole time, and then him standing there that whole time, bringing truth to world powers is proof that God was speaking through Daniel to the Gentiles and to the world. Daniel was faithful. Look at John 17, verse four. The Lord Jesus, as his life was near the end, in John 17, four, said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I think Daniel, in his lifespan, in his 90 years in this, on this earth, his 70 years in captivity, was a man that finished the work that God gave him. That's an encouragement to me. I'm gonna finish the work that God has given to me. And I want you to make that same commitment. From today on, no matter what, I, we are gonna serve the Lord. Isaiah 42, verse six. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand and keep thee and give thee a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. That's what Israel was supposed to be, a lighthouse to the world. Did they fail? Yeah. Do we fail today as we're in a different dispensation? God isn't done with Israel, but now God is using what we call the church age, where we're not Jew or Gentile, we're one in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that time period will end, I believe, soon, and Israel will be cast again into the forefront to bring the light to the world. They eventually will be the light to the world when we enter into the millennium. We know that because in Zechariah 8, verse 21, here's a prophecy of the future, that when Israel will finally fulfill their role to be the light to the world. In Zechariah 8, 21, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in these days it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Pray and love the Jewish people. Some of you are Jewish. I love the fact that you've seen Jesus, Yeshua, as your Messiah, as the, the, the Christ. I love that. And, and we should bring the, the gospel, the Bible says, to the Jew first. You say, well, why should I bring them the gospel first? They've rejected Jesus. They, they gave us Jesus, didn't they? They gave us the word of God. We should love them for that and that alone, and also that God isn't done with them. We should love them, pray for them, and bring them the gospel. Why first? Because somebody's gotta be first. Why wouldn't we bring it to the people that, that God has used to bring us salvation, right? So that's a prayer. That's hopefully what our hearts are all about, that God isn't gonna quit on his people, his earthly people, Israel. God uh, wants us to not quit either in our lives. Young people, there is a day when our heart will stop beating and our lungs will stop inhaling and exhaling. It could be tomorrow. Some people live a few years. Some, some people live 100 years. Remember the span, the span. What, what is the span? How many years do you have in that span? We don't know. That's why we need to serve the Lord today, today. Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now we have an enemy. The enemy wants to stop you. The enemy wants to 
discourage you. The enemy wants you to do something that will harm you and harm other people. He's a liar. My granddaughter, Willow, said, Gramps, um, I have some questions for you. I think she actually said that to Karen, my wife Karen. And uh, Karen said, go ask Gramps. So, which is fine. I, I absolutely loved it. So we went and sat down. We have a, we have a little playroom in our house for, for the grandkids. And, and she sat me down and she kind of arranged everything. And so we're having this serious conversation. And she said, my mom and dad told me that um, God, or, or that the devil tricked this is the situation I was telling you about, that the devil tricked someone and he's done wrong. And uh, he's, she said, Gramps, what would keep the devil from tricking me to doing something like that and, and disobeying God? What would keep my mom and dad from being tricked of the devil and doing something like that? And I said, "Hun, we have God and we have the word of God and if we'll just believe him and obey him, we won't be tricked. We won't be fooled. Do you know the devil is an angel of light? Let me show you this. This was sent to me by someone from Fairbanks as we were filming the, the Aurora show for In Grace. And um, this just came to me out of the blue yesterday as I'm dealing with this issue. And he said, um, he said he thought it looked like a serpent, the tail of a serpent, the head of a serpent. And I, and I had to think, the devil is real. He's the angel of light. He's out to destroy. He wants to tell you, oh, God was withholding. Isn't that what the devil was telling Eve? God is trying to keep back something from you. He doesn't want you to have any fun. He wants to be the boss. He wants to be in charge. Well, here's the, here's the deal. God is in charge. He is the boss. There's none like him. We should fall on our face before him every day and obey him. And he's given us the ability to do that by giving the spirit of God to us, we, ha we have no excuse. But that devil is going to try to deceive you. Oh, it looks so beautiful. It looks so great. You know the Bible says in Job that he was accusing Job before God. He only serves you, God, because you bless him. So God allowed some things to happen in Job's life, and Job said, though he slay me, I will trust in him. That is what we need to do when, in, when faced with trials and say, Lord, I'm not gonna quit. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna believe this old devil. I'm not gonna let him have another victory. He's had too many victories. Don't let it happen in your life. And if there's something in your life, deal with it. Take care of it. Confess it. Get help. Don't destroy yourself. Don't destroy other people. Because you never, if it's a sin in your life, it's never just your sin. It's affecting so many people. One author has put it this way, and leave that aurora up on the screen. Has the enemy destroyed the holy city? Because Nebuchadnezzar, it looked like Nebuchadnezzar took out God. He took, he took out the city, he took out the temple. He took the, the treasures from the temple. Has the enemy destroyed the holy city and the holy temple and taken God's people captive? Fear not for there is still a godly remnant that worships the true God and serves him. Does the enemy attempt to defile that godly remnant? Fear not, for the Lord will work on their behalf and keep them separated to himself. Are godly believers in places of authority? Fear not, for the Lord will see to it that they are prepared and anoint, appointed. Does the Lord desire to communicate his prophetic truth to his people? Fear not, for he will keep his servants alive and alert until the work is done. Are you in a place of responsibility and wondering how long you can hold out? Fear not, for the same God who called you and equipped you is able to make you continue until the, com the task is completed that he has assigned for you. This is another aurora. Obviously, I think you can see the cross of Jesus. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Faithful, 1 Thessalonians 5.24, is he that calleth you who also will do it. That is the truth. And every time you read a Bible verse, you're hearing truth. 
You say, why do you have to deal with someone's sin in somewhat of a public way? Because there's nothing, there's, there's no such thing as a private sin. And we don't want to embarrass people, we don't want to hurt people, but if, if there's something that's egregious, something that is really serious, it's a really bad thing, we have to, we can't, we can't hide it. We can't act like it's not there. It is there. And we have to, we have to come before God honestly. That's why truth is so important. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. God wants to work, even in, even in failure. If you've done something, and I know some of you have because we've talked and, and, and there's forgiveness of God and there's forgiveness from us and we'll forgive anybody. And we want everybody to succeed. But until you deal with that, you will never succeed. You will never fulfill God's word in your life. Even if in this life no one ever finds out what it is, God knows. God wants to do great and mighty things through you. He wants to give you a span. A span. You know that word is also used as a verb, span. And the dictionary definition of span is to provide with something that extends over. A span, like to span a river or to span a chasm. And I love, we'll go back to that cross, Aurora. And this is a real picture taken uh, up in Alaska. Um, again, is that God making a cross? I don't know. It's probably just the aurora, just the way he captured it. But I'd like to say it's God. Uh, it's certainly the auroras are God's handiwork in the heavens. But I still love this picture, and I'm going to use it to give the gospel. Do you see what the aurora of this cross is? It's a bridge. It, the chasm is hell. That's what we deserve. How do we get to God? How do we get restored? How do we get reconciled? The cross is the bridge. The cross of Jesus Christ is what makes it to where I can go to heaven. Daniel can go to heaven. He was, he was believing in the future cross. He didn't know all the details. He didn't know the name. He didn't know everything, but now we do. But he was still looking forward to God's promised one that would come to pay for our sins. Uh, the Bible says that all of us have sinned. The Bible says that you and me have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Daniel did. We don't see any egregious sin, but he was a sinner. Jesus never sinned. He came, God in the flesh. He came and died for our sins on the cross. He rose again the third day and says, if anyone who will believe in me will have everlasting life, you are restored, you are redeemed, you are brought back. Yeah, can we still sin? Yeah, but you know what? You're still in the hand of God. He paid for all of your sins on the cross. That's why there's hope in this life and in eternity. If you've never received Jesus Christ by faith, I beg you at this very moment to not pass up this chance. Why? Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. Then let us serve him. Let us never quit. Let us never give up. Let us plow forward no matter what happens. And we're resolved to do that. And God is going to get the glory. He's going to get the glory. I promise you that. He's going to get the glory. And let us bring glory to God. Would you please bow as we conclude in prayer? Just before I pray, with your heads bowed, with your eyes closed, I want to speak to that person hearing my voice today, either here or outside, that has yet to receive the gospel. The gospel is simple. I just told you, Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sins on a cross. You have to pay for your own sins in eternal hell, but he doesn't want that. He loves you. He died for you. If you'll receive him by faith, by trusting in him, not a religion, not a priest or a pastor, but in the person and work of Jesus, if you'll believe in him, that he died for your sins on that cross, that he rose again the third day, proving that he is God. If you'll trust in him right now, at this very moment, at this very instant, the Bible says you are saved. Right now, you're saved forever. You've passed from death to life. And if you have made that decision today, you say something like this silently to the Lord, he can hear your thoughts. I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I put my trust right now in Jesus, the one who died and rose again for me, paid for my sins on a cross, 
poured out his blood, and that pure, precious blood of Jesus washes me whiter than snow. And if you've done that today, I would love to rejoice with you. No one will be embarrassed. Would you just hold your hand up right now? You're saying, today, Pastor Scudder, I finally understood the gospel. I finally put my trust in Jesus Christ right now. Is there someone here that has done that? Just raise your hand and hold it up for a moment. I really wanna pray for you and encourage you, and I will not embarrass you. Is there someone today making that decision of faith? Maybe there is somewhere, and you don't have to raise your hand to be saved, but salvation is available to every person, no matter what you've done, and every person needs salvation, no matter how good you think you are. Now, folks, let me ask you another question. Do you want wisdom? Do you want to finish your life as Daniel did, to have the span of a faithful man or woman for God? I'm gonna pray for you all. Lord, how grateful we are for salvation, for the hope of eternal life. And then also, Lord, we're so grateful that you allow us to serve you and live for you. Help us to stay close to the word because the devil is very deceptive. The truth needs to look really close. The lie needs to look really close to the truth. And that's what the devil does. But Father, help us to be wise. Give us that wisdom to see it, to avoid it. When that little spark starts of temptation, that we, that we beat it out that we don't let that spark turn into a forest fire. So Father, we ask that for all of us and all of our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.